So here we are. Um, Everything is alive, part two incoming. Um, so I was kind of um, talking about smallish systems um, and suggesting that kind of you know the stick of rock life cognition goes all the way down. But um, what about the sort of broader kind of you know the, the bigger cosmos and planets and galaxies and so on and so forth and um, you know. Because physics describes these, apparently describes these systems so well, um, you know, to, to, to tiny amounts of precision, uh, predictive um, accuracy and so on. Um, and that kind of makes you think, well, OK, if it can all be described with, um, so, you know, let's say sort of classical mechanics or something then it's it's just perfectly predictable and you know there's no there can there can be no sort of deviation from these these laws and they presumably apply everywhere you know whichever way we point the telescopes things are obeying you know einstein's gravity and so on um well i mean you know i mean the first thing to say about that is um you know we know that our perceptual apparatus is is constrained um we, we you know we know that um you know we don't we don't see the whole truth of what's going on so just to infer um some homomorphism there about the regularity of the world out there is 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 probably a leap of faith um so that's the first thing to say and the other thing to say is that um even if they do ob observe certain kind of regular maybe sort of habitual patterns of behavior that doesn't mean that there's no sort of cognition involved um in these systems right so um so this is where i i'm going to um introduce a, another thinker actually to the table his name's olaf stapledon and he's um he's quite well known for um star maker which was kind of heralded i think as one of the earliest sort of perhaps if not the first kind of science fiction novel um which he always kind of denied he said well this isn't science fiction this is philosophy <laughs> right so he's written this um fantastic i mean i mean the scale of it is phenomenal you know this guy kind of it starts off with a guy i think he has an argument with his wife going stands on a hill contemplates um the cosmos for a while and he eventually kind of leaves his own body and goes off on a sort of cosmic quest um he seeks out other life on other planets and so on and uh, you know he's quite terrified to begin with because he doesn't find it eventually he does um and then he kind of upscales and realizes that actually solar systems themselves have certain forms of cognition um and they can gather things in certain ways. They can, you know, you know, they can do that twisting on a sort of cosmic scale and twist things to a certain will, whether it be a subtle kind of long haul, sort of strategic kind of um, inclination, or possibly even sort of more decisive actions and so on and so forth. So, anyways, um, you know, kind of what we're saying, what I'm saying here is, is that he conceived of this idea of being able to move through different scales of cognition from, you know, sort of like the lowliest sort of figure in a pond somewhere all the way through to solar systems um, which he sort of suggested have minds um, and galaxies galaxy clusters and so on and so forth all the way up to the, the kind of like the whole cosmos if, if there is such a thing um, and the godhead and i think he eventually sort of had an encounter with the godhead and he saw various universes being created and um, different kind of configurations and so on and that was the star making you know this this was kind of you know the will behind everything um so that you know that's kind of interesting stuff now i think that this is actually going on and i think there might even be scientific ways of determining this as well and i'm going to draw on the ants nest again as a metaphor for this right so those individual ants don't know what's going on right in the whole picture that's that's the that's the claim right but the whole picture in, in other words the colony can behave as though it has a singular intelligence right now take other um distributed sort of intelligences say uh take forests and um, with mycelial networks right again you know you've got all these tiny little chunks that look sort of like discernible single objects like a tree like a, a plant but when you look more deeply you realize that these these guys are all part of a you know a, a, a deeply complex interconnected network right um and so there, you know, for me, there is an intelligence that transcends those individual, um, you know, sort of cohabitants, if you like, of the network. And that intelligence can make decisions. And we know this, and this is um, scientifically demonstrable, because we know, we can see that um, forests respond to certain conditions, like sort of um, sick, you know, disease and so on by killing off surrounding vegetation so as not to spread the disease now that is a tactical decision that, that that's not just some kind of randomly emergent oh it's you know been favored because 
you know, behaviours before that didn't do that were disfavoured. This is a tactical intervention in in a system, right? And the kind of thing that you know you can watch pool balls, you know, bashing around on a table. Someone can stick their hand on the table and stop those physics, and you know that's kind of like an intervention, right? This is, you know, this is kind of the sort the sort of thing that points to free will, right? And so it seems as though this system, this um, this whole forest, can make you know, it can change direction. It can change its own. It can change behaviours, in the same way that I can kind of think, "Oh, let's exercise my finger and wiggle, wiggle my digits." Right? Um, this forest right, <laughs> thinks, "Oh, there's part of me's hurting over there. There's some sickness. It doesn't feel right. Let's um, let's contain it. Let's control it. Let's let's um, let's improve my situation." And I say my situation because yes, I'm suggesting that that forest has some sort of metacognition. Right. I mean, it would be you know unrecognizable to the sort of metacognition we have. The sensory apparatus, the the information networks, the way it moves um, stuff around is going to be radically different. So the so the consciousness that 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 observes the, the, this information um, will be having a very different sort of experience to us. But uh, it's nevertheless an experience, and it's metacog metacognizant. So now let's think about you know that particular forest, right? So it might be surrounded by desert. And then you could say, well, that forest is. You know, that's a distinct forest, that's a singular entity. But then you realise that, you know, it's plugged into the same sphere that everything else is on this planet. So you could kind of scale up and say, well, let's look at things at the, the planetary scale, right? And you will probably find evidence of um, that same sort of decision-making behaviour. I mean, for all we know, um, you know, maybe diseases can be released to control certain life forms. Maybe, maybe we're the latest experiment of Gaia. Maybe we're the latest kind of... Um, you know, sapling um, to sort of grow up, and and you know maybe maybe she thinks things are going well. I mean, you know, if 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 there's a planetary singular planetary consciousness, then chances are it probably wants to, um, uh, you know, sort of spread itself or something, or, or kind of you know reproduce or make friends, um, and you know, and then you look at the behaviour of human beings, and what are we doing? We're building spaceships to take life or this kind of life that we to to other planets, right? So. You know, that looks like, you imagine the planet Earth as a single flower. That looks like a flower spreading its pollen, you know, or sending out a, um, a you know, spore, like a fungal spore. And talking of fungal spores, I mean, apparently some um, space equipment came back from one of these um, these missions. Is it Mars? I'm not sure. And um, they, lo and behold, they found some fungus on the side of the ship, right? I mean, obviously, that it was from Earth. I'm not saying there was fungus on Mars, but they, some fungus had got on the ship, and it continued growing, and it survived spaceflight. So, again, yet more um, credence to the idea that fungus might be from outer space, and if it's not from outer space, it, for some reason it can survive travelling through outer space. Right, so we know that um, fungal spores have um, you know, solar radiation-resistant casings, for example. I mean, what the fuck? Why do they have that? You know, there's, there's, there's normally a reason for things. Um, and you know, a, a spore having solar radiation resistant casing would suggest that well, maybe they've evolved in space. Um, you know, and so, or, or they've evolved for some reason to be able to survive space journeys. Um, certainly, the ones that didn't <laughs> didn't make it because they can. So, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Talking of um, biology, I've got a bloody bit of a virus at the moment, um, which is probably. Self-aware, <laughs> he probably has certain metacognition, thinking I'm going to screw this guy over. Um, <coughs> his ideas are terrible. Um, so, so I'm I'm thinking. So let's let's take that planet. You can see the planet as a single entity, right? Um, you know, I mean, let's just sort of take a step back and say, right, you know, Matt is a single entity. Well, is it? Drill into Matt. Find that I'm made up of loads of different organs, some of which could even be regarded as sort of separate animals. And we know that during um, Sort of development, developmental stages that organs actually compete for resources in, in bodies, right? Um, they have their own kind of boundaries, a, you know, a Markov blanket, a kidney has a Markov blanket, if you like, and it, a, a self and a non self, and it exchanges um, information and nutrients across these sort of permeable um, uh, boundaries and so on. So, you know, a kidney is a kind of an animal, right? I'm not a single being, right? I mean, there's tons of life forms that I carry around in this body that aren't, don't even have my DNA, right? And so what you're hearing now is, um, well, the sounds being made um, by a collective intelligence, right? I am that ant's nest. Yeah, we can train ants, ants nest to do specific things and solve specific problems that you would expect a singular centralized intelligence to be able to do, right? 
but we're point we're looking at little six legged creatures um scurrying around you know um well my kidney is one of those six legged creatures you know my my heart is an animal that takes um, nutrients and processes things moves things through it has it has its own um kind of volition and function right um it's just another part of this collective intelligence that we call Matt Gray for convenience but i'm not a single um, standalone kind of object or even a single standalone process because as I mentioned earlier in part one you know the idea of the tree when I mean take this for it you know as, an, as a challenge to things like identity and um, sing, singleness you know where, where does a river end right does a river end kind of you know is there an imaginary line that the, the river doesn't really end does it you know so the river Thames you say well where does that end well if you keep following it you'll end up in Hawaii or something right it's part of the same body of water um, so whilst we have these kind of sp um, separate functions um, going on, they're all still embedded within the same substrate. Right? So you could, you could say that there's no disconnection at all, but obviously there are these persisting forms which distinguish themselves. And I would say that that's about that twisting that we discussed earlier. Right? You sort of you dissociate to such an extent that you can literally be, it, you know, for all intents and purposes, it looks like you're a single entity but in, in fact you're of course you're still floating around in a sea of deep um, complexities and so on I mean, and the physics would, would, would say that you know the, these are electromagnetic fields and so on and um, so look so I think so So if you imagine you know planets may have some kind of singular Gaia like um, intentionality perhaps then maybe solar systems do right um, I mean you know for me in the same way that life seems to pull materials into um, certain processes and kind of uh, sort of occasions of sort of significant interrelations and so on. Um, the, the, so, so as we said with the tree earlier, you know, the tree never really ends. It kind of, it pulls in and pushes out, right? Um, but it can't really do any of that without the conditions that surround it. Um, so shit, I think I've I kind of lost my way a little bit there. Right, so um, yeah, so we're talking about planets, talking about sort of solar. System. Oh yeah, that's right. So you you could look at the so so you've got all these planets brought into orbit around the sun. You could say that that's kind of part of that sort of dynamic, that kind of basal cognitive sort of dynamic that says I want to do something. There's I'm doing something. I'm acting. You know, there's a, there's an act kind of an action that goes on and it attracts nearby materials and so you know gravity could be uh, you know in some sense it could be about that it could be about that kind of there's a sort of yeah that kind of um, free energy dynamics going on that says oh I, I'm, I'm doing something bring you know come come you know sort of and it sort of gathers attention in sort of surrounding um you know mentation and so on and and some of it's drawn into it and you you've got this vision and actually um Olaf Stapleton, Stapleton describes this beautifully. He talks about um, like the birth of new stars um, or solar systems and so on. And sometimes you get these kind of, um, you know, maybe maybe two solar systems that are themselves orbiting, maybe a giant black hole or something in a, in a galaxy. And they're on a kind of orbit that that means that you know they're obeying the laws of physics. They're in a groove, like you're on a record going round, round, round. But um, but something, but within that, there is still some sort of kind of will to to continue doing that, right? And then these two stars kind of pass by each other. You know, there's maybe on a kind of long orbit where they kind of pass each other, and they pass so close that they attract. You know, there's a kind of gravitational sort of dynamic that attracts some of the materials from both of those stars into a new um, sort of vortex. That then starts taking on its own kind of dissociated identity, and it could become a new star. You know that, and, and this is one of the ways in which uh, new stars can be born, right? And isn't it, I mean that's fantastic. So you've got this kind of parental notion, um, and the generations, and um, and of course, you know, the, in, in some sense, the DNA of that new star will contain a little bit of the the elements of one parent and a little bit of the the elements of the other, and and you can imagine all kinds of complex dynamic. Um, cosmological situations like this where you've got this sense of kind of regularity in the groove the chance of those two stars kind of bumping into each other and say the chances of two human beings bumping into each other and falling in love and then the dynamic activity attraction probably some tension and um, dissonance 
and then finally this kind of compromised agreement this 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 next creation of both of those um sort of traveling vortices um producing a new traveling vortex vortex and so you know you could imagine that um you know, if we're talking about the planets having identity and, and cognition, then maybe solar systems, maybe galaxies. And imagine the kind of minds that could be, um, that, that, that could occupy these collectives. Right? Um, I mean, do they feel planets like we feel fingers? You know, do they see a journey ahead through space in the same way that we see a journey to the shop? You know, do they, do they, are they aware of their their travel how do they see time this this um this idea of a species a species present do they have a longer species present can they see it and, and feel things and have moments that are you know millions of years long compared with with ours um and there's this other thing as well it's um you know tying in with this this idea that you know i mean obviously we're part of the same system that generates all of this stuff and this is one of the reasons why i say life goes all the way down i think life is what's doing the universe right and the, i mean i've said before the universe is in us right? the universe is this universe is um what we're doing at the moment right and um we being conscious agents you know I, i'm very much in the hoff hoffmanian kind of um paradigm now and but given that we're um, we're still milling about building stuff, and we can build machines, and we can build AI, and we can build structures and superstructures, right? And there's this kind of these amazing images, um, sort of future um, thinking, where you see these gigantic platforms built on the Earth for you know housing, you know popular, you know you can have like sort of massive shelves, with gigantic sort of structures that house people above and below, and you can have massive gardens and jungles and things like that on them and stuff. And you imagine us building machines that eventually have um, intelligence and then super machines and super machines that can make make themselves and make even better machines and so on and so forth. And all of this kind of being integrated with our biological substrate. So we've got this you know, gigantic sort of super, uh, super mega kind of computational structures, right? Sort of mega structures. Um, and we can kind of like float around and, and, and meet other mega structures, and um, and then sort of you know imagine the kind of forms of mentation that could be experienced, you know, in these structures. And um, and I wonder, you know, whether with these heightened levels of sort of cognitive ability and stuff, whether actually we can is it does that mean that we'll have we'll have more power to be able to penetrate into some of these metaphysical mysteries. You know, is it the case that advanced civilizations somewhere else in the galaxy that have done more head scratching and so on? Do they know more? And if so, what is it? You know, um, what, what you know, what kind of minds would be able to peel back some of these metaphysical mysteries? If indeed we we need any more, do we do we need any more, or do we just need convincing about the um, truths that we've already discovered? You know, um, are we are we just kind of beating our way out of a kind of materialistic paradigm and um, actually once we've managed to untrain ourselves from some of the clearly failing logic and language of materialism that actually it will become certain we don't need any more kind of technology or superstructures to figure stuff out but it's just a curious idea isn't it this idea that you know it happens around us all over the place collective intelligences look at the um, Portuguese man of war that is not a single animal that's a collection of different animals that have learned to kind of coexist so the tentacles are one particular species and the main kind of um you know body is another and there are different entities different species living on the tentacles doing different jobs like cleaning and digestion and you know that's not one animal right <coughs> and yet it looks like a <coughs> cohesive whole so um, again you know i you sort of look out and think well there's the distant stars they're miles away from each other they can't possibly interact but but why not if you can cross one distance you can cross another right and there's there's um you know, the idea of the brain is that it's full of all these kind of um, very mycelial-esque sort of networks. The galaxy, when you zoom out, looks like a mycelial network. Um, Chrissy's brought this up and said, oh, hang on, why does the cosmos look like a, a brain? You know, <laughs> well, what's going on there? Um, and so, so for me, I, I think there is cognition at, uh, in, in a multitude of different layers between here and the Godhead, if such a thing exists, which I think it does. Um, I do think that the cosmos is self-aware. I think the cosmos has um, metaconsciousness. And I think the evidence for that is the intelligence that it displays in the unfurling of nature. 
And as we get around some of these issues with you know, observation um, constraints and entropy and so on and so forth, we'll we'll peel back some layers and we will see that there is intelligence in nature to the to the extent that we will be able to talk to it, yeah, and treat it like a like a like an old friend. Um, so so there it is, some crazy stuff, quite speculative. I think it's entirely consistent with an idealist worldview. I don't think it's consistent with the materialist. I don't, I don't, you know, I mean, you can you can have, multi, you know, mega computational superstructures in a materialist framework, but uh, you know, they, there's no, they wouldn't be able to reveal anything about metaphysics because they don't, they, there aren't any metaphysics other than their own central claim, which rejects metaphysics. <laughs> um, certainly, if they're logical positivists as well. Anyway, I hope that some of that makes sense. Um, I, I think um, it is possible to test these these things as well. I reckon, um, you know, if if you could find ways of sort of um, analysing human crowd behaviour and things like that, you could potentially prove that there might be some sort of metacognition going on within human groups, or is there way is there a way of testing, you know, large scale kind of environmental change or ecological changes that look like they're displaying some kinds of intelligence, um, but it's not fungus, you know? I mean, maybe the evidence is already there. Anyway, let's see what you guys think. Um, uh, lots of areas within this, I think, to further explore. But uh, let's see what we've got now. Cheers, guys.